We're continuing a series in the book of Romans in our teaching time together, so I'll just pray for a moment and then we'll begin. Father, thank you that we can gather within these walls, listening for your voice, and asking that you would shape us to be people who represent your heart in order that we might be people of hope in the world, Father. Uh, we're mindful every day that our world is losing its grip on hope, displaced by anxiety and fear and anger. Would these moments, Father, uh, enable us and empower us to cling to you and confidently in faith embody hope? And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. On January 1st, 2002, something remarkable happened in Europe because the Eurozone had been created. And so beginning on January 1, 2002, uh, an entirely different currency overtook every country, the Euro. And if you've traveled in Europe, you know about the Euro. I traveled in Europe both prior to 2002 and subsequent. And it was a big question among the European Union regarding how smoothly this transition would go. Because to move from one currency to another, literally overnight, is quite a challenge. December 31, in Germany, it's the mark. January 1, the mark is out, the euro is in. What, uh, what Germany did, at least in one uh, town, on New Year's Eve, they held a funeral for the mark. And so it was like, a, you know, there's a, there was a casket and people would come and put their marks in it and there was a, like a little, the mark has been good to me, kind of eulogies and that kind of thing. Uh, and, but the thing that's amazing is uh, overwhelmingly it worked so that on January 1, people began spending in currency uh, the euro. How does that happen? How do people just all of a sudden move from one currency to another? And here's, the, here's how, faith. That's how, that's how it works, it's the only way. Because here's the deal, you need to see this. Currency only has value when a party believes it has value. That's the way it works. And you just ask Venezuela about that, or Iran, or Greece, or Germany in 1929, or Iceland recently. Currencies go up and down depending on the faith that people have in it. So. Uh, all the faith moved from here to here, from, in Germany's case, from the mark uh, to, to the euro. And this is what we're talking about this morning when we're talking about faith. Faith is what activates the currency that changes our lives. The currency isn't faith. The currency is Christ. So here we are, needing faith to, to activate this new currency, Christ. And when we activate this new currency, we move from people of fear and, and anxiety and anger, as I just prayed, to people of hope and mercy and love. And this is desperately where we want to be. It's the life for which we're created. How do we, how do we move there? Well, there's three questions in Romans 4 that we'll unpack together regarding this subject. And the first question is, you know, what is faith, basically? And the, and the second question, why is Abraham used as an example of faith? And the third question is, what motivates us then to make this kind of currency exchange and get off the ground of our own life and on the ground of Christ? So we begin with this first question. What is faith? And the example that is given is Abraham, and particularly Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. If you know a little bit about Abraham, he was called by God out of a polytheistic culture, uh, and God's intent would be to establish a new nation through Abraham. And so he tells him to leave his home and his family and go to a new land where God will establish him. And he says that in this new land, he'll be, the fa he'll be a father and then the become the father of many nations as well, right? And so what you see from Genesis 12 to 15, where we'll pick up the text in a moment, is Abraham uh, offering us this kind of blend of belief and doubt over and over again. Uh, he, he leaves his... Uh, homeland, as he was told to, but he doesn't leave his whole family. He takes his nephew with him. So he believes, he doubts. He, he, has, he has, when he goes down to Egypt, he has the faith to continue to depend on God at a level, but, but he's afraid that his wife, being beautiful, is going to be kind of subdued by the Pharaoh. So he has his life lie about her identity so that Abraham can preserve his life. Faith and doubt, faith and doubt, faith and doubt. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 15, he's now walked with God, he's nearly 100 years old. God says to him in Genesis 15, hey Abraham, go out, count the stars, 
That's how many children you're going to have. And so he reiterates this promise that he's going to be the father of nations. And here's the thing, he's not a father at all. And he's been with his wife since they were teenagers. He's now nearly 100. So for probably eight decades, he's been, can I be this blunt, sexually active with his wife and come up empty, right? Now, you're telling me at 99, I'm going to suddenly have fruit. And she, by the way, is 89, Go find someone 89 and is a parent of a nursery kid right now. That's just not going to happen. So like this is all, the whole, the whole story is kind of crazy. And so when we pick it up in Genesis chapter 15, this is very, very important language. Genesis 15, uh, I read in uh, 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 verse 4, I think it is. Uh, the man, this man, Eliezer, like he had a guy living in his house who was a servant. He will not be your heir. One from your own body will be your heir. Look at the heavens, count the stars, so shall your descendants be. And then this is the critical verse. Then Abraham believed God, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. So there's that word believe, or that word faith. Uh, and it says, because he had faith, God reckoned the faith as righteousness. So here's the story. Faith is this. Are you ready? Faith is belief that God has the power to do what God says God will do. That's what faith is. Faith means that if God says God will do something, I believe that God will do it. Luke 7 is a beautiful New Testament illustration of faith. There's this guy, and he's a Roman soldier, so he's, he's Gentile, not Jewish, and he encounters Jesus, and he says to Jesus, Jesus, my son is sick, and my, okay, my son is sick, he's up in Bothell. And Jesus is like this, well, then I'll, I'll go to Bothell and heal him. And then, the, and then the soldier says, you don't need to go to Bothell and heal him. And Jesus says, what do you mean? He says, well, look, I'm a man under authority. And when I get a command, like if I get a text to go do something, I go do it. Even if the authority giver isn't there, I do it because I believe in the authority of the one giving the order. And when I give orders to my, those under my command, they go do it. And so Jesus, I know this. I know that you have authority over disease. All you need to do is say the word, you'll heal him. Then Jesus looks at his disciples predominantly a Jewish group of people. And this is what he says. I haven't found this faith in any seminary anywhere. That's my language, not his. Like, look, you people have Bible knowledge, Bible study, Bible training, Bible memorization. You're religious, but religion is not faith. Faith is believing that what God says God will do is all but done. God will do it. That's faith. And so that faith is credited to Abraham as righteousness, right? So here's what Abraham is saying. Uh, excuse me, here's what the centurion is saying in Luke 7. He says, I know you have authority over disease. You can intervene and heal. And so I want to make a couple of observations here. Faith, right, is this sense that God has the power to do what God says God will do. Observation number one, then, is this. Faith means... I believe in the power of God to intervene in our world. I believe that this world is not this kind of closed system of cause and effect, and it's just bad things happen because bad things just happen, and there's, it's hopeless, no one can intervene, life is random. No, it's not random. When God says God will intervene and we believe that, that's faith. When we need God to intervene in this world and we ask God to intervene in this world and we believe that God will intervene in this world, that is faith. So God has told us just like God told Abraham that God will intervene in the world. God has told us that evil will end, that suffering will end, that war will end, that disease will end, that human trafficking will end, and, and sexual slavery will end. And if we believe the end of the story as God has articulated it, that's faith. And if I believe that the story is headed in that direction, I become a person of hope. And this is actually the book of Habakkuk. I don't know if you guys know that book or not because it's rather obscure. But the book of Habakkuk is this prophet uh, basically whining to God, saying, hey, look, hello, God, look at me, I'm Jewish, right? Chosen, I'm the good guy here. Why are the Babylonians at the border about to invade? And then God, here's God's response. Oh, you think things are bad now? Wait till they actually do invade. It's gonna be ridiculous, man. They're gonna, they're gonna knock the walls down in the city and there's gonna be famine and people are gonna die and there's gonna, it's gonna be disease and, you know, the only the, and the survivors are gonna go, they're gonna live in exile. How's that, Right? And then, uh, this, is what, this is what God says through the prophet Habakkuk to people who are asking these questions. Why do bad things happen in the world? The just shall live by what? Faith. In other words, I believe, even 
though in this moment, everything is imploding, I believe in the end of the story. I believe in the trajectory of history. That is faith. And the result of that is I become a person of hope. So at the end of Habakkuk, Habakkuk is able to say this. Hey, even if the fig tree doesn't blossom, even if there's no grape on the vine, even if everything is chaos all around me, even if it looks as if evil is triumphing, even if the wrong person is in office, even if the election goes south, even if my currency implodes, in spite of everything, I will praise God. Why? God is the rock who is changing history. So that's it. Faith believes that God not only can intervene in our world, but does. And not only on this cosmic level, but on this personal level, because here's what Jesus says to you, John chapter 15. Abide in me, let my word abide in you. And here's a promise, you will bear fruit. Do you believe that you're made for fruitfulness? In other words, do you believe that you're made when you leave here to go out and not just survive in a world of chaos, but to go out and actively bless the world with, with hospitality and generosity and mercy? Often, here's the truth, we don't believe it. Why? Because we, like, we know ourselves so well that we believe that we're disqualified from actively being a blessing. We think, yeah, yeah, I know I'm called to fruit, but hello, when I look in the mirror, here's what I see, lust, fear, greed, shame, pride, anger, bitterness towards someone, body image issues, whatever it is that impedes my fruitfulness, that's me. And, and that becomes a barrier to faith called shame, Right? And if I'm in a sense of shame, I need that last song that we just sung. I'm a child of God. That's who I am. God said it, I believe it. I'm deeply loved. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I have a new identity. I must believe it in spite of the evidence that's faith. So some of us, like the barrier is this shame and condemnation. But for others of us in the room, the barrier to living by faith is believing that we need God for anything. Because some of us in the room at least at times, are quite content. And we deny our own brokenness. And we deny our own brokenness by kind of changing the rules of the game and saying, oh yeah, fruitfulness, I'm fruitful. I make six figures. I'm fruitful. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm fruitful. Uh, like at, at CrossFit, like my name is second on that list on the workout of the day. I'm fruitful. Yeah, I'm fruitful. Our kids, like they memorize the Psalms over the summer. I'm fruitful. Like, so we're like, here we are over here, sometimes, and isn't this true of all of us? Sometimes we're like this, man, God's blessed me, and life's going well, and then I'm like this, thanks God, I've got it, I'll take it from here. And then what happens is when we take it from here, we make terrible decisions, our life implodes, and we're like this, God, just kill me now, I'm unworthy of anything right? And so I'm on the one hand, arrogant and proud, and on the other hand, filled with shame and condemnation, and I vacillate between shame and condemnation and arrogance and pride. Can anyone besides me in the room relate? <laughs> yeah, there's many of us in the room. So, like, how do we walk in a manner pleasing to God? Because neither of us are pleasing. How do we walk in a manner pleasing to God? Well, the answer, you'll be surprised, comes from a climbing illustration. So let me show you something here. This is, uh, this is El Dorado Peak in the North Cascades. And maybe some of you have climbed it. Uh, most of you probably not only haven't, but never would. And part of the reason you never would is because when you get to the final approach, it is literally, a, it's a knife ridge, right? So the, the final approach is just a, a width of snow, less than a foot, and you're, on, and you're walking on it, and it's steep. And if you fall on either side, unless you're like a miracle worker with an ice axe, you'll fall all the way down. So here's what you do up here. You climb always in even rope teams, rope teams of either two or four. And why, why do you think that is? Here's why. Because if I'm climbing with you and we're going up and you fall off the left side, here's what I'm supposed to do. Are you ready? Jump off the right side. <laughs> I'm supposed to do that, right? Because if I jump off the, off the right side, it arrests your fall. And, and if I fall off... The right side, what are you supposed to do? Jump off the left side. Not only to save my life, but yours, because we are roped together, which is, a, that's an entirely different illustration. <laughs> Having to do with community and baby dedications and all that stuff, but we'll, <laughs> not for now. Because in the moment, this is what I want you to see, all of us are always continually at risk of falling on the shame side and the pride side. Do you understand? 
And when I fall on the shame side, here's what God does. He reminds me, you are deeply loved. You are fully forgiven. You're a child of God. Yes, you are. We just sang it. We need to hear it. Whenever we're like overwhelmed with shame and condemnation and, and at risk of preemptively putting ourselves on the bench, as many of us are, because we're feeling guilty. And then on the other hand, when we're over here and we're on the pride side, we're like, yeah, no, I'm good. I, like I'm sober, I'm married, I'm happy, and I don't see my own brokenness. Then what God does is God reveals my brokenness. How? Through, through sometimes through preaching, sometimes through failure, sometimes through the reality of living in a fallen world and I come into a situation that is over my head and then I cry out, I can't do it. And then God says, thanks, I've been waiting for you to say that. Now I'll begin to live in you again. We're, we're called to walk on this knife ridge, but the good news is anytime I fall off, if I fall off with excessive grace, there's truth. If I fall off with shame and condemnation, there's grace. Whatever I need, God provides. That's really cool to me. So, so faith means whatever I need, God will provide. And if I believe that, that's faith. And then if I believe that, that faith is credited to me as righteousness, which is my second observation. Faith activates the currency of Christ's work on the cross. That's what happens. Faith activates the currency of Christ's work of the cross. So in 2002, overnight, if it's 2001, December 31, it's the mark. If it's January 1, 2002, it's the euro. And when it, once it's the euro, it means the mark is out. And that means uh, you have no way to spend your marks even. The only option is an underground economy, right? So to speak. Now, uh, I, when I traveled over there after the currency had changed, every time I travel in Europe, I accumulate a few mark, like a little bit of change or so, right? And so I brought it with me, but there's nowhere to spend it. You can't, you can't spend it anywhere. And the, the reason this is significant is because for us to live the life for which we are created, we need on a daily basis the currency that is Christ's death and resurrection. For me to live the life that God has made me to live, I need the, 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 like the, in, the Christ living in me, enabling me to be who I could never be on my own. So I need this currency that is Christ. And if I insist on continuing to live on the basis of the mark when it's Euro season, then I, I'll go try and spend my money, but it won't work in the real world. And I'll just say, if you've ever seen The Matrix, which I know dates me, but if you've ever seen The Matrix, the movie, you get a sense that, oh, there's a, there's a real world and there's, a, there's a, a world that's a vast illusion. And I would say that we kind of live in a culture that is a vast underground economy uh, using old currency. The old currency of your net worth, the old currency of your looks, your health, your upward mobility, your education. And here's what Jesus is saying. Hey, your money's no good here. Look, the life for which you're created, the life for which you are created is not contingent on your body mass index, your CrossFit score, how many figures you make, the size of your house. No, no, you, this is a promise. You are called, you can be a blessing in whatever circumstance and God will take care of everything. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Don't worry about what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna drink, what you're gonna wear, how you're gonna retire. Don't worry about any of it. Why? I've got it. I've got all that covered in the real economy. So get off the ground of the underground economy of your performance and onto the ground of daily saying to Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I'm anxious, your peace. I'm afraid, your courage. I'm greedy, your generosity. I'm bitterness, your forgiveness. And beginning to appropriate the new currency that is Christ. This is the Christian life. Day by day by day, thanking God that he is in us who we could never be on our own. And so we begin to live on the basis of kind of this new currency, if that makes sense. So faith then is believing that we have the currency for the life for which we're created. And, and, and Christ is offering you the presence then of his life to deal not only with uh, the, the, the penalty of sin, like the fact that you can't pay, but to deal with the power of sin. The fact that you're stuck in a cycle of of always looking back to that old currency and coming up short over and over again. Like I get off the ground of Christ 
and then I slip back into what uh, Hebrews calls a besetting sin. All of us have kind of a weak point physiologically. All of us have a weak point spiritually. And so for some of us in the room, the besetting sin is sexual. For others, it's, for others, it's kind of self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. For others, it's spending. For others, it's earning. For others, it's pride. For others, it's complacency. Like, I, I need to get off that ground and continually always be in the ground of Christ. And the way to do that is faith, because faith is, is my way of saying, I can't live the life for which I'm created, but you, Jesus, can. And if I believe that, that faith activates the currency that is Christ. And if you remember that Paul is writing to a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles here, what he's saying is remarkable, because here's what he's saying. The currency of Christ's life is the requirement to be in God's covenant family. It's the only requirement. Like, everybody needs Christ's life. Because Christ's righteousness becomes part of our new nature, because our spirit is wed with Christ's spirit, we the bride of Christ. And that means I have everything I need. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm not adequate in myself to consider anything as coming from myself, but my adequacy is from God. Without this life in Christ, I'm always falling off the knife ridge. I'm plunged into self-condemnation or pride, one or the other. The only way I walk in the knife ridge is with Christ. So that's what faith is. Faith is believing that God is able to do what God has said God will do. And if God has said to you, look, I sent Christ, Christ died, rose again, and now Christ lives in you, empowering you to be who you could never be before. It's setting you free from every power of sin in your life. Progressively, you are becoming more and more and more like Jesus. If you believe that, then that currency becomes real. (laughs) And we begin to spend it, not just here within these walls, but everywhere. We become the presence of Christ. That's faith. Now, here's the second question. Why does God use Abraham as an illustration? Like, why would he do that? Well, he's trying to show us something here. He's trying to show us that righteousness only comes through Christ and only has ever come through Christ. So there's a real chronological thing that happens by using Abraham because here's the deal. Abraham never knew the name Jesus, right? Like, if there's a timeline... You know, here's Adam and Eve, here's Abraham, here's a bunch of time, here's the cross, and then here's, here's us. So Abraham is as far before the cross as we are after the cross. So far, so good? 4,000 years or so. So Abraham's way before, he never knew the name Jesus. Now this is interesting, because uh, Paul is going to great lengths to show us that Abraham is saved, right? He's righteous, he's declared righteous. And yet... Remember what Peter said in Acts 4.12? I mean, of course you do. (laughs) Peter said, there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name Christ. Like, if you don't have the name Christ, you're not saved. And what did Jesus say? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 14.6. Like, that's what Jesus said. And then Romans, Paul in Romans. What does he say in Romans? I'm gonna read Romans 10, where he seems almost to be contradicting himself because he's talking in Romans 10 about the, kind of the need for the name of Christ. Romans 10, 9 um, says, as I find it, <laughs> says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess Jesus is Lord, you're saved. And here's Abraham who doesn't confess Jesus is Lord and he's saved. So, What's up with that? Like it seems at the surface that what the overwhelming testimony of Scripture is saying is everyone who dies without calling on the name of Christ will be condemned. Is that clear? No, it's not clear. It's it's actually not clear because one of the major points that Paul is making, and this is very important, is he's saying, look, the work of Christ, Christ's life, death, resurrection, is, hear me, the only way anyone has ever made right with God. At any time throughout history, it's the only way. But equally true, watch this, God is able to apply the work of Christ to anyone at any time who has faith. Does this make sense? So God is able to apply the work of Christ to Abraham even before the work of Christ happened because God is outside time because Jesus is called what? The Lamb of God who was slain when? before the foundation of the world. So if you're listening, your head explodes and you go, no, how can that be? That happened here and Abraham was here. 
But God says what happened here actually happened here and became visible here. And so God is applying the work of Christ whenever and wherever God wants to apply the word of Christ. So that then when you come to Romans uh, uh, 10, 17, knowing that Abraham didn't know the name of Christ, you come to Romans 10, 17, and this is what it says. It says, uh, listen, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. So I need the word of Christ. And then I say, well, surely not everyone has heard the word of Christ, have they? Have they? And then here's the weird answer. Paul says, yeah, everyone's heard. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. What do, you, what do you mean everybody's heard? They're like, Everybody doesn't have a Bible. In fact, the Bible isn't even translated in every language yet. What do you mean everybody's heard? Oh, indeed, everyone has heard. And then here's what Paul does. He quotes, are you ready for this? Psalm 19. What does Psalm 19 say? The heavens are declaring the glory of God. It says, yes, indeed, they have heard, verse 18 of Romans 10, their voice, the voice of God's character, has gone into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Boom. Kind of... Drop the mic or whatever that means. Like God has spoken to everyone already. It's done. So what does this mean? Well, I'm going to tell you one story that I hope will help clarify. So I have a friend in Nepal, and his testimony of coming to Christ is remarkable to me. Very unlike anything we see here. Here's the story. He's in, a, he's in a village uh, where within this village there's a guy who owns a tea house and his son, uh, who lives with his parents, is a teenager and is a yak herder, right? So he's out in the hillsides, herding his yak, and one day he's just sitting on a tree, literally sitting on a tree drinking chai tea, and an angel, whatever that means, an angel, <laughs> appears to him, an angel appears to him, and says to the anchor, he's Hindu, thousands of gods. The angel says, listen, I'm here to tell you that you're worshiping too many gods. And it's actually much simpler, and I want to set you free from all this complexity. So I'm going to show up every day with a scroll, and we're going to cross a few names off the list every day. So for five days, here's the angel. Nope, this god, no, no, no need, no need, no need. Ah, worthless god. Oh, weak god, gone, you know. And the list is getting shorter and shorter until at the end... There's one name at the bottom of the list, Jesus. And they, then the yak herder is really flummoxed. And he says to the angel, I don't know who this is. How can I worship who I don't know? He says, oh, don't worry, you'll know. I'm sending a messenger. There's two guys, they have a book. It's going to tell you all about Jesus. The God who became a man died, rose again. So he goes home and tells his family on, after this last vision, hey, you guys, uh, we got a, somebody coming. And he's got a book. He's going to tell us about, we, like, we don't we need to worship thousands, just one. It's going to be a lot simpler around here. And, and his parents are like this. You're crazy. And it's a shame on our culture. They, don't want, they want him to tell anyone. So they literally lock him in a cave. Two days later, a couple of students from a Bible school I taught at are trekking in Nepal. They had stayed at a tea house and promised the owner that they would make the 23-mile trek to this guy's tea house. It's monsoon rain, but we, we made our promise, we're gonna go. So they go and they stay with this guy. By the time they get there late in the, in the evening, they're shivering cold and it's been raining all day and they're warming themselves by the fire. And the owner of the tea house says, how do you like my altar where he has all kinds of statues to all kinds of gods? And these two guys, Bible school students, have the, the Bible in Nepalese and they go, oh, yeah, it's beautiful, but you know what? It's, it's just so complex. He says, really, there's only one God you need to worship. Would you, and his name is Jesus. He's the God who became a man. Would you like to hear about him? And then this guy, you know, his eyes get wide. He says, don't say anymore. My son said you'd be coming. He goes, he gets out of the cave. <laughs> they invite the whole village. The whole village gathers in the living room of this house. And these two students with three months of Bible school training under their belts, share the gospel, and the whole village comes to Christ. Everybody does. Now, here's why I share, I mean, it's a great story in and of itself, but when I heard this testimony in Estes Park from the student, I was like this, man, what if the guy had died in the cave? 
Like, is he still saved? And why do I even ask the question? Here's why. Because that's what we Westerners want to know. Who's in? Who's out? Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's up? Who's down? And I'm just here to tell you, I think on the authority of Scripture, God's got it covered. Here's what we know. There's no name other than Christ that saves anyone. We know that. That's the first thing we know. Second thing we know is that God is able to apply that to anyone who responds to the revelation they've been given. God's able to do that. And God clearly does that. He did with Abraham and Moses, by the way, and Jeremiah and Job and Rahab, the prostitute who never had a class in sexual ethics but had faith and, and is saved and is held up as an example. What? Yeah, because it's, look, it's the work of Christ. It's the work of Christ. It's the work of Christ. And God can apply that wherever God wants to apply it. It's not my job to decide who's in or who's out. It's my job, according to Scripture, to be the presence of Christ, to love my enemies, to go the second mile, to turn the other cheek, to be about justice and mercy and hospitality and reconciliation and celebration. That's my calling. That's your calling. That's our calling. Why do we spend our time shooting each other? Why are we arguing about who's in and who's out, who's right and who's wrong, when Jesus has said, it's all about me. Go out and be me. That's all you're called to do. Not judge, but love. Does this make sense? I mean, I hope it makes sense. Because if it doesn't make sense, we continue to contribute to the narrative that Christians are only known by what they're against. Oh, by the way, what they're mostly against is each other. <laughs> Followed by Democrats. <laughs> no. God's done something remarkable. We're renewed. And our calling isn't to preemptively, arrogantly declare who's in and who's out. We know only those who are in Christ are in. We know that. So just preach Christ through your life and let God sort the rest out. Third question, what motivates us? Well, what motivates us to be in Christ, there are several motivations. Number one, I could just go deep into the law and see my need for Christ. Romans 4.15. Like you want to play by those rules? Well, you, this way you'll find your, your uh, marks are no good anymore. Like you can't live the life for which you're created. You're called to, to peace and you're not sleeping well. You're called to generosity and you got a fist on your money. You're called to intimacy in your marriage and you're married but not intimate. You're called to hospitality and you're wasting your evenings watching reruns. You're called. Like, you're called. And and I need Christ. I can't live the life for which I'm created. That's what motivates me. The other thing that motivates me is in chapter five, which is just obviously on the heels of chapter four, but like the first few verses are significantly tied to chapter four. So I just read a couple. Uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Do you want to, I'll just tell you, this is a motivator. You want peace? Like, this is a world that is almost a peace-free zone right now. And we think perhaps if we could build a shelter around our uh, psyche and our being or something, we could, we could have peace. no. If I want peace, I need Christ. I need the currency that is Christ. And for that to happen, I need faith. I need to, I need to say, yeah, Jesus, I'm anxious. I want the, your peace. That motivates me. And finally, what motivates me is what he talks about here, our, our mortality. He says, look at this. Uh, we are able to rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, proven character, Hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. And the reason that I uh, talk here about mortality in the context of tribulations is this. Over and over and over again, people learn to appropriate the currency that is, is Christ's life in the midst of trials. That's how it happens. The, the, like the trial of cancer, the trial of infidelity, the trial of a, of a, of a child that you want to be walking in a certain way and isn't. And... Uh, the beauty of trials is this, even if you go through life relatively trial-free, you eventually you get older. And when you get older, just getting older is the trial, right? Like, it's the truth. Like, like I, for me, the way that presents 
isn't, I'm grateful, in health problems in the moment, but it presents this way. When I, like I went for a run on Thursday and I absolutely love this time of year. It's a, my favorite time of year, the colors of the trees and stuff like that. And every year now, in my 60s, I'm like this. I wonder how many more times I get to see these red leaves. How many more? Like once, maybe? 10, 30, I don't know. But I come home from a run and then I write in my diary, Lord, teach me to number my days, man, because I don't know how many I have. And I want to spend every day imparting hope. That's what I want to do. I don't want to waste what I've been given. But for me to live the life for which I'm created, I need Christ. What motivates you? That's the question on the table. Whatever motivates you, the promise is this. When we say to Christ, the currency by which I've been living, either in my whole life or in this particular area, the currency is no good. I receive you. The, here's the promise, peace. We become people of hope in a world thirsty for the hope found in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that uh, you have enabled us through the currency of Christ to embody nothing less than the hope for which the world is hungry. Would we receive that hope today in real ways as we respond by faith? We pray in Christ's name. Amen.